Hello, and welcome to The Learning College. My name is Alex Linder, and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com, at pieville.net, and at kirksvilletoday.com. Today, we're going to do all of Chapter 14 of 200 Years Together, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book about the history of re interreactions between Jews and Russians. Again, chapter 14. Now, you may remember I had recorded out of order. Recording number nine is chapter 13. And now we're moving on in, in correct order to chapter 14, having done 1 to 12 as well. So what is chapter 14 called? It's called During 1917. So last chapter, we heard about the February Revolution, and now we're going to hear more about that year. Chapter 14, during 1917, this is page 430, it runs about 20 pages until we get into the footnotes at the end, which we don't do. So, chapter 14, 200 years together, during 1917, very fateful year for Russia. In the beginning of April 1917, the provisional government had discovered to its surprise that Russian finances, already for some time in bad shape, were on the brink of complete collapse. In an attempt to mend the situation and stir enthusiastic patriotism, the government loudly announced the issuance of domestic freedom loan bonds. Rumors about the loan had been begun circulating as early as March, and Minister of Finance Tereshenko informed the press that there were already multi-million pledges from bankers to buy bonds, quote, mainly from the Jewish bankers, which is undoubtedly related to the abolition of religious and national restrictions. So again, we've been hearing about how they push for complete revolution and complete legal civil equality for Jews, as well as keeping any privileges they may have had. And they're impatient with the Tsar. They want the Tsar gone. They want autocracy gone. They want democracy. They want, and they already have huge influence amounting to dominant influence in the media. So you can see what all this is going to lead up to and add up to. Indeed, as soon as the loan was officially announced, names of large Jewish subscribers began appearing in the newspapers, accompanied by prominent front-page appeals. Jewish citizens subscribe to the Freedom Loan, and every Jew must have the Freedom Loan bonds. In a single subscription drive in a Moscow synagogue, 22 million rubles was collected. During the first two days, Jews in Tiflis subscribed to 1.5 million rubles of bonds, Jews in Minsk to half a million in the first week, the Saratov community to 800,000 rubles of bonds. In Kiev, the heirs of Brodsky and Clara Ginsburg each spent one million. The Jews abroad came forward as well. Jacob Schiff, one million. Rothschild in London, one million. In Paris, on the initiative of Baron Ginsburg, Russian Jews participated actively and subscribed to several million worth of bonds. Now, I know we repeated a little of this when we did Recording 9, but that's okay. We'll just start from the beginning of the chapter. We only did a couple pages. So anyway, they put out a bond appeal to raise money for the new government, and Jews are subscribing because they like what's going on in the February Revolution. At the same time, the Jewish Committee in Support for Freedom Loan was established and appealed to the public. However, the government was very disappointed with the overall result of the first month of the subscription. For encouragement, the lists of major subscribers who purchased bonds of 25,000 rubles or more were published several times, in the beginning of May, in the beginning of June, and in the end of July. Quote, the rich who did not subscribe were shamed. What is most striking is not the sheer number of Jewish names on the list, Assimilated Russian Germans with their precarious situation during the Russo-German War were in the second place among bondholders, but the near absence of the top Russian bourgeoisie, apart from a handful of prominent Moscow entrepreneurs. In politics, quote, left and center parties burgeoned, and many Jews had become politically active. From the fir very first days after the February Revolution, central newspapers published an enormous number of announcements about private meetings, assemblies, and sessions of various Jewish parties, initially mostly the boon, but later Powali Zion, Zionist, Socialist Zionist, Territorialist Zionist, and the Socialist Jewish Workers' Party, SJWP. 
By March 7, we already read about an oncoming assembly of the All-Russian Jewish Congress. Finally, the pre-revolutionary idea of Dubnov had become widely accepted. However, quote, because of sharp differences between Zionists and Boondists, the Congress did not materialize in 1917, nor did it occur in 1918, either, quote, because of the civil war and antagonism of Bolshevik authorities, quote, in Petrograd, Jewish People's Group was reestablished with M. Vinever at the helm. They were liberals, not socialists. Initially, they hoped to establish an alliance with the Jewish socialists. Vinever declared, quote, we applaud the boon, the vanguard of the revolutionary movement, close quote. Yet the socialists stubbornly rejected all gestures of rapprochement. The rallying of Jewish parties in Petrograd had indirectly indicated that by the time of revolution, revolution the Jewish population there was already substantial and energetic in Petrograd. Surprisingly, despite the fact that almost no, quote, Jewish proletariat, unquote, existed in Petrograd, the boon was very successful there. It was extraordinarily active in Petrograd, arranging a number of meetings of local organization in the Lawyers Club, and then on April 1st in Teneshev's school, there was a meeting with a concert in Mikhailovsky Theater, then on April 14 to 19, quote, the All-Russian Conference of the Boon took place, at which a demand to establish a national and cultural Jewish autonomy in Russia, self-governance, was brought forward again. So they want to eat their cake and have it too. After conclusion of speeches, all the conference participants had sung in the Boon's anthem, Oath, the Internationale, and the La Marseille. All these commie songs. The Boon's anthem, Oath, capital O, the Internationale, that's the communist song, and the Marseille. And, as in the past, Boone had to balance its national and revolutionary platforms. In 1903, it struggled for the independence from the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, and yet in 1905, it rushed headlong into the All-Russian Revolution. Likewise, now, in 1917, the Boone's representatives occupied prominent positions in the Executive Committee of the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. A Soviet is a Russian term used for an elected, at least in theory, council. Soviet, a workers' council, elected workers' council, and later among the Social Democrats of Kiev. So Soviet is a key term to understand. An elected council, and I think generally it means a workers. By the end of 1917, the Bund had nearly 400 sections countrywide, totaling around 40,000 members. Developments in Poale Zion, P-O-A-L-E, and Zion, two words, were no less amazing. In the beginning of April, they also held their All-Russian Conference in Moscow. Among its resolutions, we see on the one hand a motion to organize the All-Russian Jewish Congress and discuss the problem of emigration to Palestine. On the other hand, the Powali Zion Conference in Odessa had simultaneously announced the party's uncompromising program of class warfare. Quote, Through the efforts of Jewish revolutionaries, democracy, the power over the destinies of the Jewish nation, was wrested from the dirty grasp of wealthy and settled Jews, despite all the resistance of the bourgeoisie to the right and the boon to the left. Do not allow the bourgeois parties to bring in the garbage of the old order. Do not let the hypocrites speak. They did not fight, but sweated out the rights for our people on their bended knees in the offices of anti-Semitic ministers. They did not believe in the revolutionary action of the masses. Close quote. Then in April 1917, when the party had split, the, quote, radical socialist, unquote, Powali Zion, moved toward the Zionists, breaking away from the main, quote, social democratic Powali Zion, which would later join the Third International. Like the two above-mentioned parties, the SJWP also held its statewide conference at which it merged with the Socialist Zionist, forming the United Jewish Socialist Workers' Party. Isn't that funny? Vereinigkeiten, Yiddish, Yiddish, Union, basically, and parting with the, like Vereinig, United in German, and parting with the idea of, quote, any extraterritorial Jewish nation, unquote, with its own parliament and national autonomy. Vereinigkeiten appealed to the provisional government, asking it to declare equality of languages and to establish a council on the affairs of nationalities, unquote, which would spec specifically, quote, fund Jewish schools and public agencies. 
At the same time, Phreinichite closely collaborated with the socialist revolutionaries. However, it was Zionism that became the most influential political force in the Jewish milieu. As early as the beginning of March, the resolution of Petrograd Zionist Assembly contained the following wording, quote, the Russian Jewry is called upon to support the provisional government in every possible way to enthusiastic work to national consolidation and organization for the sake of the prosperity of Jewish national life in, in Russia and the national and political renaissance of the Jewish nation in Palestine. So have it both ways. All this is buildup of Jew activity, communist, revolutionary, socialist, but also at the same time Zionist, nationalist, and uh, both ways. Both ways, a lot of activity in both ways. They want it all, all different ways. They want to dominate your country and they want their own country. And what an his, inspiring historical moment it was, March 1917, with the British troops closing in on Jerusalem right at that time. Already on March 19th, the proclamation of Odessa Zionists stated, quote, Today is the time when the states rearrange themselves on national foundations. Woe to us if we miss this historic opportunity. Again, remember the Balfour Declaration and uh, them being promised that they're going to swing their support from Germany to the Allies in World War I if they are guaranteed British support for the occupation of establishment of Israel and Zion. In April, the Zionist movement was strongly reinforced by the public announcement of Jacob Schiff, again an American. So you see, it doesn't matter what, what nation the Jews are in. They're all working together who had decided to join Zionist, quote, because of fear of Jewish assimilation as a result of Jewish civil equality. So the minute in Russia, so the minute they get equal rights, well, we also have to stay separate and superior, but we also want full equal rights. So any white nation that grants them, any white nation that allows Jews anywhere inside of itself is insane. It's taking on, it's like voluntarily introducing a cancer tumor into your body absolutely insane. They want it both ways at all times. So they've been pressing for decades and decades to get full legal equality in Russia. And the minute that happens, well, we also are afraid that we're going to assimilate if we have full civil equality. So we also need all this other stuff as well, special rights within Russia and the establishment of Israel. Schiff believes that Palestine could become the center to spread ideals of Jewish culture all over the world. In the beginning of May, Zionists held a large meeting in the building of the Petrograd Stock Exchange with Zionist hymns performed several times. Imagine that, in, the Pet in a stock exchange, they're singing Zionist hymns. In the end of May, the All-Russian Zionist Conference was held in the Petrograd Conservatory, it outlined major Zionist objectives, cultural revival of the Jewish nation, social revolution, and the economic structure of Jewish society to transform the nation of merchants and artisans into the nation of farmers and workers, an increase in emigration to Palestine, and mobilization of Jewish capital to finance the Jewish settlers. Both Jabotinsky's plan on creation of a Jewish legion in the British army and the I. Trumpeldorf's plan for the, quote, formation of a Jewish army in Russia, which would cross the Caucasus and liberate Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, from Turkish occupation, have been discussed and rejected on the basis of the neutrality of the Zionists in the World War I. The Zionist conference decreed to vote during the oncoming local elections for the parties, quote, not farther to the right than the People's Socialists, unquote, and even refused to support constitutional Democrats like D. Pasmanic, who later complained, quote, it was absolutely meaningless. It looked like the entire Russian Jewry, with its petty and large bourgeoisie, are socialists. His bewilderment was not unfounded. The Congress of Student Zionist Organization, Gekhover, G-E-K-H-O-V-E-R, student Zionist Gekhover, with delegates from 25 cities and all Russian universities, had taken place in the beginning of April in Petrograd. Their resolution stated that the Jews were suffering not for the sake of equality in Russia, but for the rebirth of the Jewish nation in the native Palestine. They decided to form legions in Russia to conquer Palestine. Overall, quote, 
During the summer and fall of 1917, Zionism in Russia continued to gain strength. By September, its members numbered around 300,000. On to 433. It is less known that in 1917, Jewish, quote, Orthodox movements enjoyed substantial popularity second only to the Zionists and ahead of the socialist parties, unquote, as illustrated by their success, quote, during elections of the leadership of reorganized Jewish communities. There were rallies, parentheses, quote, the Jews are together with the democratic Russia in both love and hatred, public lectures, the Jewish question and the Russian revolution, citywide, quote, assemblies of Jewish high school students in Petrograd and other cities, aside from general student meetings. In Petrograd, the central organ of the Jewish students was established, though not recognized by the Bund and other leftist parties. While many provincial committees for the assistance to the, quote, victims of the war, unquote, i.e. to Jewish refugees and deportees, ceased to exist because at this time, quote, democratic forces needed to engage in broader social activities, unquote. And so the Central Jewish Committee for providing such aid was formed by April. In May, the Jewish People's Union was established to facilitate consolidation of all Jewish forces to prepare for the convocation of the all-Russian Jewish Union and to get ready for the oncoming elections to the Constituent Assembly. In the end of May, there was another attempt of unification. The Steering Committee of the Jewish Democratic Alliance convened at the Conference of All Jewish Democratic Organizations in Russia. Meanwhile, lively public discussion went on regarding convocation of the All-Russian Jewish Congress. The Boon rejected it as inconsistent with their plans. The Zionists demanded the Congress include on their agenda the question of Palestine and were themselves rejected by the rest. In July, the All-Russian Conference on the Jewish Congress preparation took place in Petrograd, so people who are extremely organized. Because of social enthusiasm, Vinaver was able to declare that the idea of a united Jewish nation dispersed among different countries is ripe, and that from now on, the Russian Jews may not be indifferent to the situation of Jews in other countries, such as Romania or Poland. So we're all one nation, no matter where we're scattered. We're going to set up a new historical nation in, in our land of Palestine that we claim we used to live there originally. The Congress date was set for September. What an upsurge of Jewish national energy it was. Even amid the upheavals of 1917, Jewish social and political activities stood out in their diversity, vigor, and organization, says Solzhenitsyn. So Jews are getting really, really active, and then we see what happens from that. The, quote, period between February and November 1917 was a time of blossoming, the time of blossoming of Jewish culture and health care. In addition to the Petrograd publication, The Jews of Russia, the publisher of The Jewish Week had moved to Petrograd. Publication of the Petrograd Torgblatt in Yiddish had begun. Remember, that's what most of them speak, is Yiddish. And now they've learned Russian. Similar publications were started in other cities. The Tarbut and Culture League, a network of secular Hebrew language schools, had established, quote, dozens of kindergartens, secondary and high schools, and pedagogic colleges, unquote, teaching both in Yiddish and in Hebrew. A Jewish grammar school was founded in Kiev. In April, the first All-Russian Congress on Jewish Culture and Education was held in Moscow. It requested state funding for Jewish schools. A conference of the Society of Admirers of Jewish Language and Culture took place. The Habima Theater, the first professional theater in Hebrew in the world, opened in Moscow. There were an exposition of Jewish artists and a conference of the Society on Jewish Healthcare in April in Moscow. These Jewish activities are all the more amazing given the state of general governmental, administrative, and cultural confusion in Russia in 1917. A major event in the Jewish life of the time was the granting of official permission for Jewish youth to enlist as officers in the Russian army. It was a large-scale move. In April, the headquarters of the Petrograd military district had issued an order to the commanders of guards military units to immediately post all Jewish students to the training battalion at Nizhny Novgorod with the purpose of their further assignment to military academies, that is, virtually mass-scale promotion of young Jews into the officer ranks. Quote, Already in the beginning of June 1917, 
131 Jews graduated from the accelerated military courses at the Konstantinovsky Military Academy in Kiev as officers, 131 Jew officers. In the summer of 1917, Odessa, 160 Jewish cadets were promoted into officers. In June, 2,600 Jews were promoted to warrant officer rank all over Russia. Again, nothing good can come from this. You can absolutely see and know that. There is evidence that in some military academies, Junkers, used in Tsarist Russia for cadets and young officers, again, the people who landed estates noblemen in Prussia, met Jewish newcomers unkindly, as it was in the Alexandrovsky Military Academy after more than 300 Jews had been posted to it. In the Mikhailovsky Military Academy, a group of Junkers proposed a resolution that, quote, although we are not against the Jews in general, we consider it inconceivable to let them into the command ranks of the Russian army. See, again, the, the, the old thinking, so the state arose and it was Jews were seen as a separate and alien people. And now you start letting them into all these posts and you can conf become confused about who you are. Well, if a Jew can be a general and a Jew can be your equal, then what, what, why are you even Russian? How does Russian even exist at all? The Jews are certainly not giving up any of their identity, but you are if you yield to them. The officers of the academy disassociated themselves from this statement, and a group of socialist Junkers, 141 strong, had expressed their disapproval, quote, finding anti-Jewish protests shameful for the Revolutionary Army, unquote, and the resolution did not pass. When Jewish warrant officers arrived to their regiments, they often encountered mistrust and enmity on the part of soldiers for whom having Jews as officers was extremely unusual and strange. Yet the newly minted officers who adopted new revolutionary style of behavior gained popularity lightning fast, says Solzhenitsyn. On the other hand, the way Jewish junkers from the military academy in Odessa behaved was simply striking. In the end of March, 240 Jews had been accepted into the academy. Barely three weeks later, on April 18, old style, there was a 1st of May parade in Odessa, and the Jewish junkers marched ostentatiously singing ancient Jewish songs. Did they not understand that Russian soldiers would hardly follow such officers? What kind of officers were they going to become? It would be fine if they were being prepared for the separate Jewish battalions. Yet according to General Denikin, the year 1917 saw a successful formation of all kinds of national regiments. Polish, Ukrainian, Transcaucasian, the Latvian units were already in place for a while except the Jewish ones. It was, quote, the only nationality not demanding national self-determination in military. And every time, when in response to complaints about bad acceptance of Jewish officers in the army formation of separate Jewish regiments was suggested, such a proposal was met with a storm of indignation on the part of the Jews in the left with accusations of a spiteful provocation. So they actually demand to be separate and integrated for control, I think. Newspapers had reported that Germans also planned to form separate Jewish regiments, but the project was dismissed. It appears, though, that new Jewish officers still wanted some national organization in the military. In Odessa on August 18, the Convention of Jewish Officers decided to establish a section which would be responsible for connections between different fronts, quote, to report on the situation of Jewish officers in the field, unquote. In August, quote, unions of Jewish warriors appeared. By October, such unions were present at all fronts and in many garrisons. During the October 10 to 15, 1917 conference in Kiev, the All-Russian Union of Jewish Warriors was founded. Although it was a new revolutionary army, some reporters still harbored hostility toward officer corps in general and officers' epaulettes in particular. For instance, A. Alperovich whipped up emotions against officers in general in Virzhevia, Vidomosti, Stock Exchange News, as late as May 5th. Various sources indicate that Jews were not eager to be drafted as common soldiers, even in 1917. Apparently, there were instances when, to avoid the draft, sick individuals passed off as genuine conscripts at the medical examining boards and, as a result, some district draft commissions began demanding photo IDs from Jewish conscripts. 
an unusual practice in those simple times. It immediately triggered angry protests that such a requirement goes against the repulsion of national restrictions and the Ministry of Internal Affairs forbade asking for such IDs. In the beginning of April, the provisional government issued by an order by telegraph to free without individual investigation all Jews previously exiled as subjects of espionage. Some of them resided in the now-occupied territories, while others could safely return home, and yet many deportees asked for permission to reside in the cities of the European part of Russia. There was a flow of Jews into Petrograd, Jewish population of 50,000 in 1917, and a sharp increase of Jewish population in Moscow, 60,000. Russian Jews received less numerous but highly energetic reinforcement from abroad. Take those two famous trains that crossed hostile Germany without hindrance and brought to Russia nearly 200 prominent individuals, 30 in Lenin's and 160 in Natanson Martov's train. This is the this is the example the conservatives always use to blame Germany for what the Jewish communists did. And then also say, well, they're not Jews because they were atheists, even though Jew is a race, not a religion. But take the two famous trains that crossed hostile Germany without hindrance and brought to Russia nearly 200 prominent individuals, 30 in Lenin's and 160 in Natanson hyphen Martov's train, with Jews comprising an absolute majority. The list of passengers of the ex-territorial ex ex trains were for the first time published by V. Burtsev, B-U-R-T-S-E-V. They represented almost all Jewish parties, and virtually all of them would play a substantial role in the future events in Russia, that is, the revolution. Hundreds of Jews returned from the U.S., former emigrants, revolutionaries, and draft escapees. Now they were all the revolutionary fighters and victims of czarism. By order of Kerensky, he's the one who took charge after the February Revolution preceding the Bolshevik in October, the Russian embassy in the USA issued Russian passports to anyone who could provide just two witnesses to testify to identity literally from the street. So again, the rules are relaxed for Jews. It's been this case between USA and Russia for more than 100 years. The situation around Trotsky's group was peculiar. They were apprehended in Canada on suspicion of connections with Germany. The investigation found that Trotsky traveled not with flimsy Russian papers, but with a solid American passport, inexplicably granted to him despite his short stay in the USA, and with a substantial sum of money, the source of which remained a mystery. On June 26, at the exalted Russian rally in New York City, directed by P. Rutenberg, one-time friend and then a murderer of Gapon, G-A-P-O-N, Abraham Kagan, the editor of the Jewish newspaper Forwards, addressed Russian ambassador Bakhmetev, quote, on behalf of two million Russian Jews residing in the United States of America, quote, we have always loved our motherland. We have always sensed the links of brotherhood with the entire Russian nation. Our hearts are loyal to the red banner of the Russian liberation and to the national tricolor of the free Russia. He had also claimed that the self-sacrifice of the members of Narodna Volya, literally the will of the people, a terrorist left-wing revolutionary group in Tsarist Russia, best known for its assassination of Tsar Alexander II, known as the Tsar of Liberator for ending serfdom, quote, was directly connected to the fact of increased persecution of the Jews, unquote, and that, quote, people like Zundelevich, Dyke, Gershuni, Lieber, and Abramovich were among the bravest, unquote. And so they had begun coming back, and not just from New York, judging by the official introduction of discounted railroad fare for political emigrants traveling from Vladivostok. At the late June rally in Whitechapel, London, quote, it was found that in London alone, 10,000 Jews declared their willingness to return to Russia. The final resolution had expressed pleasure that, quote, Jews would go back to struggle for the new social and democratic Russia. Unquote. Destinies of many returnees hurrying to participate in the revolution and jumping headlong into the thick of things were outstanding. Among the returnees were the famous V. Volodarsky, M. Yuritsky, and U. Larin. The latter was the author of the War Communism Economy program. It is less known that Yakov Sverdlov's brother, Veniamin, was also among the returnees. Still, 
he would not manage to rise higher than the deputy NARCOM, or People's Commissar of Communications, and a member of the board of the Supreme Soviet of the National Economy. Moise Karitnov, Lenin's associate in emigration, who returned to Russia in the same train with him, K-H-A-R-I-T-O-N-O-V, Karitnov, quickly gained notoriety by assisting the anarchists in their famous robbery in April. Later, he was the secretary of PERM, Saratov, and Sverdlov Gubkoms, Gubernia's party committee, and the secretary of Ural's Bureau of the Central Committee. Semyon Diamondstein, a member of a Bolshevik group in Paris, would become the head of the Jewish Commissariat of the People's Commissariat of Nationalities, and later the head of Yevsek, Jewish section, at the All-Russian Central Executive Committee. He would, in fact, supervise the entire Jewish life, Semyon Diamondstein. Amazingly, at the age of 18, he managed, quote, to pass qualification tests to become a rabbi, unquote, and became a member of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, all this in the course of one year. Similarly, members of the Trotsky's group had also fared well. The jeweler G. Melnichansky, the accountant Freeman, the typographer A. minkin Menson and the decorator gomberg zorin had respectively headed Soviet trade unions. Pravda, the dis- Dispatch of Office of Banknotes and Securities, and the Petrograd Revolutionary Tribunal. That was a bunch of lists of things that he'd headed. Soviet trade unions, Pravda, the, the paper, the Dispatch Office of Banknotes and Securities, and the Petrograd Revolutionary Tribunal. That's one Jew doing that. gomberg zorin Names of other returnees after the February Revolution are now completely forgotten, yet wrongly so, as they played important roles in the revolutionary events. For example, the doctor of biology, Ivan Zalkind, had actively participated in the October coup, and then in fact ran Trotsky's People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. Semyon Kogan Semkov became the, quote, political commissar of Izhevsk weapons and steel factories in November 1918. That is, he was in charge of the vindictive actions during the suppression of major uprising of Izhevsk workers, known for its large and many thousands victims toll. In a single incident on the Sobornaya Square in Izhevsk, I-Z-H-E-V-S-K, 400 workers were gunned down. Just think about all those pogroms that we spent all those chapters on where at most, like, 40 people died. Tobinson Krasnosh Chekhov later headed the entire Far East as the secretary of the Far East Bureau and the head of the local government. Gershfeld Stashevsky, under the pseudonym Verkovsky, was in command of a squad of German POWs in turncoats. That is, he laid the foundation for the Bolshevik international squads. In 1920, he was the head of clandestine intelligence at the Western Front. Later, in peacetime, quote, he, on orders of the Cheka Presidium, had organized intelligence network in Western Europe. He was awarded the title of honorary Czechist. Among returnees were many who did not share Bolshevik views, at least at the time of arrival, but they were nevertheless welcomed into the ranks of Lenin's and Trotsky's party. For instance, although Yakov Fishman, a member of the Military Revolutionary Committee of the October Coup, had deviated from the Bolshevik mainstream by participating in the left socialist revolutionary insurrection in July 1918, he was later accepted into the Russian Communist Party of Bolsheviks, RCPB, and entrusted with a post in the Military Intelligence Administration of the Red Army. Or take Yefim Yarchuk, who had returned as an anarchist syndicalist, but was delegated by the Petrograd Soviet to reinforce the Kronstadt Soviet. During the October coup, he had brought a squad of sailors to Petrograd to storm the Winter Palace. The returnee Veselvalad Volin Eichenbaum, the brother of the literary scholar, was a consistent supporter of anarchism and the ideologist of Makhno, M-A-K-H-N-O, a Ukrainian separatist anarchist movement, he was the head of the Revolutionary Military Soviet in the Makhno Army. We know that Makhno was more of an advantage than a detriment to Bolsheviks, and as a result, Volin was later merely forced to emigrate 
together with a dozen other anarchists. The expectations of the returnees was not unfounded. Those were the months marked, or the months marked by a notable rise to prominence for many Jews in Russia. The Jewish question exists no longer in Russia. Still, in the newspaper essay by D. Eisman, Sura Alperovich, the wife of a merchant who moved from Minsk to Petrograd, had expressed her doubts. Quote, so there is no more slavery and that's it? So what about the things, quote, that Nicholas of yesterday did to us in Kishinev? in response to the Kishinev pogrom. In another article, David Eisman, A-I-Z-M-A-N, thus elaborated his thought, quote, Jews must secure the gains of revolution by any means, without any qualms. Any necessary sacrifice must be made. Everything is on the stake here, and all will be lost if we hesitate. Even the most backward parts of Jewish mass understand this. No one questions what would happen to the Jews if the counter-revolution prevails. He was absolutely confident that if that happens, there would be mass executions of Jews. Therefore, quote, the filthy scum must be crushed even before it had any chance to develop in embryo. And see, that's, that's why whites can't organize anywhere, because the Jews are smart. They're not stupid like us. They don't allow other people to mix with them. They maintain their independence, even if they live among other people. And they absolutely do everything they can, and including, if need be, murder, to prevent any kind of white organization from arising. And yet that is exactly what must be done. We have to do to them first what they have been doing to us. That's the only way we're going to get out of the situation we're in. That's the importance of this learning college and teaching you that. Therefore, says the Jew, the filthy scum must be crushed even before it had any chance to develop in embryo. Their very seed must be destroyed. Jews will be able to defend their freedom. Crushed in embryo and even their very seed, it was already pretty much the Bolshevik program, though expressed in the words of the Old Testament. Yet whose seed must be destroyed? Monarchists? But they were already breathless. All their activists could be counted on fingers. So it could only be those who had taken a stand against the unbridled, running wild Soviets, against all kinds of committees and mad crowds, those who wished, again, here he is betrayed by his Christianity. He can't perceive what it is. It's a racial thing they have against whites, because they do the exact same thing. Russia is not unique here. They do the same thing. They attempt to do the same thing in every single country that's white majority. The Jews attempt to crush, kill the seed. The seed of white people is what, it, what they're after. And the Christians refuse or cannot see it. Doesn't matter how high IQ there is, Christianity blinds you. It's an ideology that blinds you to aspects of reality by uh, simply denying them. So he can't, he can't figure out who they're taking their stand against. Well, it's very obvious. It's whites. It's goyim. So he's saying, well, who, who are they after? Who do they hate? So it can only be those who had taken a stand, since there aren't any monarchists left, there aren't any monarchs, and there's a handful of monarchists. So it could only be those who had taken a stand against the unbridled, running wild Soviets, these elected workers' councils, against all kinds of committees and mad crowds, those who wish to halt the breakdown of life in the country, like today in America, prudent ordinary people, former government officials, and first of all, officers, and very soon, the soldier general Kornilov. So basically white people is what he should arrive at. There were Jews among the counter-revolutionaries, but overall, that movement in Russia was the national one, was the Russian national one. So it's Jews versus Russians, and really it's Jews versus whites, even though Solzhenitsyn can't perceive that or say that. What about the press? In 1917, the influence of the print media grew. The number of periodicals and associated journalists and staff was rising. Before the revolution, only a limited number of media workers qualified for draft deferral, and only those who were associated with newspapers and printing offices, which were established in the pre-war years. They were classified as defense enterprises, despite their desperate fight against the governmental and military censorship. But now, from April, on the insistence of the publishers, press privileges were expanded with respect to the number of workers exempt from military service. Newly founded political papers were henceforth also covered by the exemption sometimes fraudulently, as the only thing needed to qualify was maintaining a circulation of 30,000 for at least two weeks. Draft privileges were introduced on the basis of youth, 
for the political immigrants and those released from exile, everything that favored employment of new arrivals in the leftist newspapers. At the same time, rightist newspapers were being closed. Malenkaya Gazeta, small newspaper, and Narodnaya Gazeta, people's newspapers, were shut down for accusing Bolsheviks of having links with Germans. When many newspapers published the telegrams fraudulently attributed to the Empress and the fake was exposed, it was, quote, an innocent joke of a telegraph operator lady, unquote, for which, of course, she was never disciplined. And so they had to retract their pieces. Birgeva Vidomosti, for instance, had produced such texts, quote, it turned out that neither the special archive at the main department of Post and Telegraph, where the royal telegrams were stored, nor the head office of Telegraph contain any evidence of this correspondence. So they were just making shit up. Then when they're caught, they just move on to make something else up. Never any consequences. See, they presented it as if the telegram were real, but all traces of their existence had been skillfully erased. What a brave free press, says Solzhenitsyn. New section, bottom 438 here. As early as in the beginning of March, the prudent Vinaver had warned the Jewish public, quote, apart from love for freedom, self-control is needed. It is better for us to avoid highly visible and prominent posts. Do not hurry to practice our rights. Now, this is our rev revolution, but let's, let's hide behind the scenes so they think it's a Russian revolution. We know that Vinaver and also Dan, Lieber, and Branson, quote, at different times have been offered minister posts, but all of them refused believing that Jews should not be present in Russian government. They want to be behind the power behind the scenes. The attorney Vinaver could not, of course, reject his sensational appointment to the Senate, where he became one of four Jewish senators, together with G. Blumenfeld, O. Grusenberg, and I. Gurevich. There were no Jews among the ministers, but four influential Jews occupied posts of deputy ministers. V. Gurevich was a deputy to Avksentiev, the Minister of Internal Affairs, S. Lurie was in the Ministry of Trade and Industry, S. Schwartz and A. Ginsburg, Naumov, in the Ministry of Labor, and P. Rutenberg should be mentioned here too. From July, A. Galpern became the Chief of the Administration of the Provisional Government after V. Nabokov. The Director of First Depart Department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was A. N. Mandelstam. The assistant to the head of the Moscow Military District was 2nd Lieutenant Scher, S-H-E-R, since July 1917. From May, the head of Foreign Supply Department at General Staff was A. Mickelson. The commissar of the Provisional Government in the Field Construction Office was Naum Glasberg. Several Jews were incorporated by Chernov into the Central Land Committee, responsible for everything related to allotting land to peasants. Of course, most of those were not key posts, having negligibly small influence when compared to the principal role of the executive committee, whose ethnic composition would soon become a hotly debated public worry. At the August conference dedicated to the disturbing situation in the country, apart from the representatives of Soviets, parties, and guilds, a separate representation was granted to the ethnic groups of Russia, with Jews represented by eight delegates, including G. Sliosberg, M. Lieber, N. Friedman, G. Landau and O. Grusenberg. The favorite slogan of 1917 was, quote, expand the revolution. All socialist parties work to implement it. I.O. Levin writes, quote, there is no doubt that Jewish representation in the Bolshevik and other parties which facilitated expanding the revolution, Mensheviks, social revolutionaries, etc., socialist revolutionaries, with Respect to both Jewish general membership and Jewish presence among the leaders greatly exceeds the Jewish share in the population of Russia, i.e. this is a Jewish revolution. This is an indisputable fact, says Solzhenitsyn. While its reasons should be debated, its factual veracity is unchallengeable and its denial is pointless. I guess he's still quoting the Jew, admitting that this is a Russian revolution is a Jewish revolution. They were A lot of them were in the February, but then they kept pushing and got the October, and that was almost wholly Jewish, is my view. The factual veracity of that claim is unchallengeable, and its denial is pointless, and, quote, a certainly convincing explanation of this phenomenon by Jewish inequality before the March Revolution is still not sufficiently exhaustive. Members of central committees of the socialist parties are known. 
Interestingly, Jewish representation in the leadership of Mensheviks, the right and the left socialist revolutionaries, and the anarchists was much greater than among the Bolshevik leaders. At the Socialist Revolutionary Congress, which took place in the end of May and beginning of June 1917, 39 out of 318 delegates were Jewish, and out of 20 members of the Central Committee of the party elected during the Congress, seven were Jewish. A. Gotts was one of the leaders of the right-wing faction, and M. Natanson was among the leaders of the left socialist revolutionaries. What a despicable role awaited Natanson, quote, the wise mark, unquote, one of the founders of Russian Narodnichestmo, populism, quote unquote. During the war, living abroad, he was receiving financial aid from Germany. In May 1917, he returned to Russia in one of the extraterritorial ter trains across Germany. That is, Germany allowed it to go across them during the war because they wanted to destabilize Russia so they can win the war, <laughs> which results in weak Anglo-American conservative uh, Christian cowards blaming Germany for what Jewish communists did. In Russia, once he's back there from the train, he had immediately endorsed Lenin and threw his weight in support of the latter's goal of dissolving the Constituent Assembly. Actually, it was he who had voiced this idea first, though Lenin, of course, needed no such nudge. Moving on to page 440. Let's see here. Local government elections took place in the summer. Overall, socialist parties were victorious and, quote, Jews actively participated in the local and municipal work in a number of cities and towns outside of the former Pale of Settlement. For instance, socialist revolutionary O. Minor became head of the Moscow City Duma, member of the Central Committee of the Boon, a. Weinstein, Rachmiel of the Minsk Duma, Menshevik I. Polanski of the Ekaterinoslav Duma, Bundist D. Chertkov of the Saratov Duma, G. Schreider had become the mayor of Petrograd, and A. Ginsburg Naumov was elected deputy mayor in Kiev. But most of these persons were gone with the October coup, and it was not they who shaped the subsequent developments in Russia. It would become the lot of those who now occupied much lower posts mostly in the Soviets, the workers' elected councils, they were numerous and spread all over the country. Take, for instance, Kinchuk, K-H-I-N-C-H-U-K. Kinchuk, head of the Moscow Soviet of Workers' Deputies, or Nasimovich and M. Triliser of the Irkutsk Soviet. The latter would serve in the Central Executive Committee of the Soviets of Siberia and become a famous Czechist. The Czechist is KGB, it's their intelligence, their killers, their night police. All over the provinces, quote, Jewish socialist parties enjoyed large representation in the Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies, councils, the Council for Soviet. They were also prominently presented in the All-Russian Democratic Conference in September 1917, which annoyed Lenin so much that it, he had even demanded surrounding the Alexandrinsky Theater with his troops and arresting the entire assembly. The theater superintendent, Comrade Nashatir, would have to act on the order, but Trotsky had dissuaded Lenin. And even after the October coup, the Moscow Soviet of Soldiers' Deputies had among its members, according to Bukharin, Dentists, pharmacists, etc., representatives of trades as close to the soldier's profession as to that of the Chinese emperor. So workers in name only. But above all of that, so the, the public mask or representation is that these are workers, but a lot of them are just Jews, or maybe dentists or something. But above all of that, above all of Russia, from the spring to the autumn of 1917, stood the power of one body, and it was not the provisional government. It was the powerful and insular executive committee of the Petrograd Soviet. She's saying this is the real power that's coming to be. The, the Petrograd Council, the executive committee. And later, after June, the successor to its power, the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, CEC. It was they who had in fact ruled over Russia. 
the all-Russian Central Executive Committee. While appearing solid and determined from outside, in reality they were being torn apart by internal contradictions and interfactional ideological confusion. Initially, the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies unanimously approved the Order No. 1, but later was doubtful about the war, whether to continue destroying the army or to strengthen it, because remember, they're in a war, and Lenin's going to get out of the war in order to consolidate his uh, political control of Russia. That's the price of it. Quite unexpectedly, they declared their support for the freedom loan, thus they had incensed the Bolsheviks, but agreed with the public opinion on this issue, including the attitudes of liberal Jews. The presidium of the first all-Russian CEC, Central Executive Committee, of the Soviet wor of Workers, Soviet of Workers, the Council of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, the Chief Executive Council of the Soviet of, so, you, know, you see what I'm saying? These are kind of boring bureaucratic type names, but this is where the real power is, the presidium of the first all-Russian CEC of the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, the first governing Soviet body, consisted of nine men. Among them were the Social Revolutionaries, SRs, A. Gotts, G-O-T-S, and M. Gendelman, G-E-N-D-E-L-M-E-N, the Menshevik F. Dan, who's a Jew, D-A-N, and the member of Boone, M. Lieber, L-I-B-E-R. So these are Jews who are in the, the Presidium. They're the first governing Soviet body. There's a lot of Jews in it. In March, at the All-Russian Conference of the Soviets, plural, councils, Gendelman and Steklov, S-T-E-K-L-O-V, had demanded stricter conditions be imposed on the Tsar's family, which was under house arrest, and also insisted on the arrest of all crown princes. This is how confident they were in their power. The prominent Bolshevik L. Kamenev, K-A-M-E-N-E-V, was among the members of the, that presidium. It also included the Georgian Chikhaidze, C-H-K-H-E-I-D-Z-E, the Armenian Sakjan, S-A-A-K-J-A-N, one Krushinsky, K-R-U-S-K, H-I-N-S-K-Y, most likely a Pole, he says, and Nikolsky, likely a Russian. Quite an impudent ethnic composition for the governing organ of Russia in such a critical time. So they go from an Aryan king, a monarch, to a, a workers' council that's made up mainly of Jews. Apart from the CEC of the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, there was also the All-Russian Executive Committee of the Soviet of Peasants Deputies. They have councils of workers and soldiers. They just happen to use the word Soviet. I don't really exactly know why, but it would be easier to remember if it was council. But Soviet means council. The Council of Workers and Soldiers, elected committee representing the workers and soldiers. you got elected committee representing the peasants' deputies, and elected at the end of May. Of its 30 members, the, the Soviet of peasants' deputies, there were only three actual peasants, an already habitual sham of the pre-Bolshevik regime. Of those 30, Deep Pasmanic identified seven Jews, quote, a sad thing it was, especially considering Jewish interests, and, quote, they had become an eyesore to everybody. Then this peasant organ put forward a list of its candidates for the future constituent assembly. Apart from Kerensky, the list contained several Jews, such as the boisterous Ilya Rubanovich, who had just arrived from Paris, the terrorist Abraham, or Abram Gotts, G-O-T-S, in the little-known Gurevich, in the same article, there was a report on the arrest for desertion of a warrant officer, M. Goldman, the head of the Mogilev Gubernia, a peasant Soviet. Of course, the actions of the executive committees could not be solely explained by their ethnic composition, not at all. Many of those personalities irreversibly distanced themselves from their native communities and had even forgotten the weight of their shtetls. All of them sincerely believed that because of their talents and revolutionary spirit, they would have no problem arranging workers, soldiers, and peasants' matters in the best way possible. They would manage it better simply because of being more educated and smarter than all this clumsy hoi polloi. Yet for many Russians, from commoner to general, this sudden eye-striking transformation in the appearance 
among the directors and orders at rallies and meetings in command and in government was overwhelming, like they see a whole new type of person coming in from what they're used to under the Tsar. V. Stankovich, the only officer socialist in the executive committee, provided an example, quote, this fact of the abundance of Jews in the committee alone had enormous influence on the public opinion and sympathies. Hey, these are a bunch of Jews. Do we really want them running Russia? Noteworthy when Kornilov, and he's going to be the leader of the opposition, the whites, I think, when Kornilov, he's a Russian, met with the committee for the first time, he had accidentally sat in the midst of Jews. In front of him sat two insignificant and plain members of the committee, whom I remember merely because of their grotesquely Jewish facial features. Who knows how that affected Kornilov's attitudes toward Russian revolution? Yet the treatment of all things Russian by the new regime was very tale-telling, says Solzhenitsyn. Here is an example from the, quote, Days of Kornilov, unquote, in the end of August 1918. Russia was visibly dying, losing the war, with its army corrupted and the rear in collapse. Again, while the Russians are fighting the Germans, fighting their brother Germans, the Jews are taking control in the back. General Kornilov, cunningly deceived by Kerensky, artlessly appealed to the people, almost howling with pain. Russian people, our great motherland is dying. The hour of her death is nigh. All whose bosoms harbor a beating Russian heart. Go to the temples and pray to God to grant us the greatest miracle of salvation for our beloved country. Direct quote, of course. In response to that, the ideologist of the February Revolution and one of the leading members of the executive committee, Gimmer, G-I-M-M-E-R, hyphen Sukhanov, S-U-K-H-A-N-O-V, chuckled in amusement. What an awkward, silly, clueless, politically illiterate call. What a lowbrow imitation of Suzdalshchina. Suzdalshchina refers to resistance and Suzdal to the Mongol invaders. So the Mongols have taken over and someone desperately prayed for surcease salvation. Yes, says Solzhenitsyn, it sounded pompously and awkwardly, but without a clear political position. Indeed, Kornilov was not a politician, but his heart ached. And what about Sukhanov's heart? Did he feel any pain at all? He did not have any sense of the living land and culture, nor had he any urge to preserve them. He served to his ideology only, the international, seeing in Kornilov's words a total lack of ideological content. Yes, his response was caustic, and you understand the SJW and the wokeness in America today are exactly, I mean exactly and precisely what he means when he calls something ideological. It's new to America, but it's exactly the same thing as this in the Soviet Union, exactly. Ideological hatred and the desire to crush everyone who thinks differently. And since the ideology now calls for it, absolute hatred of all whites and desire to bring about their downfall and ultimately their genocide is what this ideology is all about. Yes, his response was caustic, but note that he had not only labeled Kornilov's appeal an imitation, he had also derogatorily referred to Suzdal's China to Russian history ancient art, and sanctity. And with such disdain to the entire Russian historical heritage, all that internationalist ilk, Sukhanov and his henchmen from the malicious executive committee, steered the February Revolution. And it was not the ethnic origin of Sukhanov and the rest. It was their anti-national, anti-Russian, and anti-conservative attitudes, like the Jew attitudes are distinct from the Jew race, Again, he's simply a, a Christian conservative, is all Solzhenitsyn is at, at the end of the day. The fact that you have a beard doesn't make you right or wise or sagacious. We have seen similar attitudes in the part of the provisional government, too, with its task of governing the entire Russia and its quite Russian ethnic composition. Yet did it display a Russian worldview or represent Russian interest, if only a little? Not at all. The government's most consistent and patriotic activity was to guide the already unraveling country, the Kronstadt Republic, 
was not only the place at which had seceded by Russia by that time to the victory in war, to the victory at any cost, with loyalty to the Allies. Sure, the Allies, their governments, public and financiers, put pressure on Russia. For instance, in May, Russian newspapers cited the Morning Post from Washington, quote, America made it clear to the Russian government, unquote, that if Russia makes a separate peace with Germany, the United States would, quote, annul all financial agreements with Russia. So even a hundred years ago, they're ready to do sanctions at the minute you're not doing what they want. Prince Lvov, L-V-O-V, Prince Georgi Lvov, led the Russian provisional government during the Russian Revolution's initial phase from March 1917 until he relinquished control to Alexander Kerensky in July 1917, upheld the sentiment, quote, the country must determinately send its army to battle. They had no concern about the consequences of the ongoing war for Russia. And this mismatch, this loss of sense of national self-preservation, could be observed almost at every meeting of the provisional government, cabinet, almost in every discussion. There were simply ridiculous incidents. Throwing millions of rubles left and right and always keenly supporting, quote, cultural needs of ethnic minorities, unquote, the provisional government at its April 6th meeting had rejected the request of the long-established, quote, Great Russian Orchestra of V.V. Andreev to continue getting paid as before, quote, from the funds of the former His Majesty's personal chancellery. The funds were confiscated by the provisional government itself. The petition was turned down despite the fact that the requested sum, 30,000 rubles per year, was equivalent to the annual pay of just three minister assistants. Deny! Why not disband your so-called Great Russian Orchestra? What kind of name is that? Taken aback and believing that it was just a misunderstanding, Andrea petitioned again. Yet with an unusual for this torpid government determination, he was refused a second time, too, at the April 27th meeting. Milyukov, a Russian historian and minister of the provisional government, did not or, order did not utter a single specifically Russian sentiment during that year. Similarly, quote, the key figure of the revolution, unquote, Alexander Kerensky, could not be at any stage accused of possessing an ethnic Russian consciousness. He was not a Jew, I believe. Yet at the same time, the government demonstrated constant anxious bias against any conservative circles, especially against Russian conservatives. Even during his last speech in the Council of the Russian Republic, pre-Parliament, on October 24, when Trotsky's troops were already seizing Petrograd, building after building, Kerensky emphatically argued that the Bolshevik newspaper, Rabochi, put, work, Rabochi put, Worker's Way, the Bolshevik newspaper Worker's Way, called Rabochi Put, and the right-wing Novaya Rus, New Russia, both of which Kerensky had just shut down, shared similar political views. So I think the point he's making in all this, now we go to the news section, is that even before the formal Bolshevik revolution, the, the, the non-Jew members were didn't give a shit about Russia. They're getting into a war that's killing it, and they're funding a bunch of affirmative action type minority stuff and, and rejecting actual Russian culture. They don't give a damn about it themselves. And he's saying that's what allow, is allowing these nasty Jews to come in and take it over, I, I feel. We're on 443, we'll, we'll go up to 450, which is the end of the chapter. The, quote, darned incognito, unquote, of the members of the executive committee was, of course, noticed by the public. Initially, it was the Educated Society of Petrograd that was obsessed with this question, which several times surfaced in the newspapers. I think that's Jews hiding behind a goyish front. For two months, the committee tried to keep the secret, but by May, they had no other choice but reveal themselves and had published the actual names of most of the pseudonym holders. Yeah, they give themselves fake Russian names, the Jews, except for Steklov Nakamkis and Boris Osipovich Bogdanov, the energetic permanent chair of the council. They had managed to keep their identities secret for a while. Jews in hiding while they're running things. The latter's name confused the public by similarity with another personality, Bogdanov Malinovsky. This odd secrecy irritated the public, and even ordinary citizens began asking questions. Who's really running things here? Why are they using fake names? It was already a typical in May that if, during a plenary meeting of the Soviet, the council, someone proposed Zinoviev or Kamenev for something, 
the public shouted from the auditorium demanding their true names. So those are true Russian names that Jews are hiding under the way they would hide under Ross or Green in the Anglophone country. Zinoviev or Kamenev, they're actually Rubenstein or Mandelstam or something. Concealing true names was incomprehensible to the ordinary man of that time. Only thieves hide and change their names. Well, what are Jews if not thieves? Why is Boris Katz ashamed of his name and instead calling himself Kamkov? Why does Lurie hide under the name, the alias Laren? Why does Mandelstam use the pseudonym Lyadov? Many of these had aliases that originated out of necessity in their past underground life, but what had compelled the likes of Schottmann, the socialist revolutionary from Tomsk, and not him alone, to become Danilov in 1917? Certainly the goal of a revolutionary, hiding behind a pseudonym, is to outsmart someone, and that may include not only the police and government, but the people themselves. In this way, ordinary people as well are unable to figure out who their new leaders are. Moving on to 444. Intoxicated by the freedom of the first months of the February Revolution, many Jewish activists and orators failed to notice that their constant fussing around presidiums and rallies produced certain bewilderment and wry glances. By the time of the February Revolution, there was no popular anti-Semitism in the internal regions of Russia. It was confined exclusively to the areas of the Pale of Settlement. For instance, Abraham Kogan had even stated in 1917, quote, We loved Russia, despite all the oppression from the previous regime, because we knew that it was not the Russian people behind it, but Tsarism. But after just a few months following the February Revolution, Resentment against Jews had suddenly flared up among the masses of people and spread over Russia, growing stronger with each passing month. And even the official newspapers reported, for instance, on the exasperation in the waiting lines in the cities. Quote, Everything has been changed in that twinkle of the eye that created a chasm between the old and the new Russia. But it is cues that have changed the most. Strangely, while everything has moved to the left, the food lines have moved to the right. If you would like to hear Black Hundred propaganda, again, that's like deplorables equivalent, then go and spend some time in a waiting line. Among other things, you will find out that, quote, there are virtually no Jews in the lines. They don't need it as they have enough bread hoarded. The same, quote, gossip about Jews who tuck away bread rolls from another end of the line as well. Quote, the waiting lines is the most dangerous source of counter-revolution. Unquote. The author Ivan Najivin noted that in the autumn in Moscow, anti-Semitic propaganda fell on ready ears in the hungry revolutionary queues. Quote, what rascals! They wormed themselves onto the very top. See how proudly they ride in their cars. Sure, not a single yid can be found in the lines here. Just you wait. Any revolution, says Solzhenitsyn, releases a flood of obscenity, envy, and anger from the people. The same happened among the Russian people with their weakened Christian spirituality. And so the Jews, many of whom had ascended to the top, to visibility, and what is more, who had not concealed their revolutionary jubilation, nor waited in the miserable lines, increasingly became a target of popular resentment. Is he saying that good Christians when they're morally in order, don't resent Jews, actually like Jews? Maybe their being good Christians is what allowed Jews to take control. Many instances of such resentment were documented in 1917 newspapers. Below are several examples. When, at the Apraxin market on Senaya Square, a hoard of goods was discovered in possession of Jewish merchants, quote, people began to shout, Plunder Jewish shops, because Yids are responsible for all the troubles. And this word Yid is on everyone's lips. A stockpile of flour and bacon was found in the store of a merchant, likely a Jew, in Poltava. The crowd started plundering his shop and then began calling for a Jewish pogrom. 
Later, several members of the Soviet workers' deputies, including Drobnis, arrived and attempted to appease the crowd. As a result, Drobnis was beaten. In October, in Ekaterinoslav, soldiers trashed small shops, shouting, quote, smash the bourgeois, smash the yids. In Kiev, at Vladimirsky Market, a boy had hit a woman who tried to buy a flower out of her turn on the head. Instantly, the crowd started yelling, the yids are beating the Russians, and a brawl ensued. Note that it had happened in the same Kiev, where one could already see the streamers. Quote, Long live free Ukraine without yids and poles. By that time, smash the yids could be heard in almost every street brawl, even in Petrograd, and often completely without foundation. For instance, in a Petrograd streetcar, two women called for a disbanding of the Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies, filled, according to them, exclusively by Germans and Yids. Both were arrested and called to account. Newspaper Ruskaya Volya, Russian Freedom, Ruskaya Volya, V-O-L-Y-A, reported, Russian Freedom Paper reported, right in front of our eyes, anti-Semitism in its most primitive form re-arises and spreads. It is enough to hear conversations in streetcars in Petrograd or in waiting lines to various shops or in the countless fleeting rallies at every corner and crossroad. They accuse Jews of political stranglehold, of seizing parties in Soviets, and even of ruining the army, of looting and hoarding goods. Many Jewish socialist agitators in the front units enjoyed unlimited success during the spring months when calls for a, quote, democratic peace were tolerated and fighting was not required. Then nobody blamed them for being Jewish. But in June, when the policy of the executive committee had changed toward support and even propaganda for the offensive, calls of smash the Yids began appearing and those Jewish persuaders suffered battering by unruly soldiers time and time again. Rumors were spreading that the executive committee in Petrograd was, quote, seized by Yids, unquote. By June, this belief had taken root in the Petrograd garrison and factories. This is exactly what Shoulder shouted to the members of the committee. Voitinsky, who had visited an infantry regiment to dissuade the troops from the looming demonstration conceived by Bolsheviks on June 10th. V.D. Nabokov, hardly known for anti-Semitism, joked that the meeting of the foreman of the pre-parliament in October 1917 Quote, could safely be called a Sanhedrin, that is a meeting of a bunch of rabbis, its majority was Jewish. Of Russians, there were only Avksentiev, me, Pesha Konov, and Tchaikovsky. Meeting of the foreman of the pre-parliament was a bunch of Jews. His attention was drawn to that fact by Mark Vishnayak, who was present there also. By autumn, the activity of Jews in power had created such an effect that even Iskri, Sparks, the illustrated supplement to the surpassingly gentle Rusko Slovo, Russian word, I guess a newspaper, that would until then never dare define public opinion in such a way, had published an abrasive anti-Jewish caricature in the October 29th issue, that is, already during the fights of the October coup in Moscow. So the people over the year 1917 he's saying are going from basically no anti-Jew sentiment to very strong anti-Jew sentiment as they realize like their nation is being taken over by a bunch of filthy yids causing bread shortages that the Jews themselves do not suffer and lines they do not stand in. The executive committee of the Soviet of workers and soldiers deputies actively fought against anti-Semitism. Again, stupid, blunder-headed, dumb use of anti-Semitism, which is a bogus concept, never valid. I cannot rule out that the harsh refusal to accept the well-deserved Plekhanov into the CEC in April 1917 was a kind of revenge for his anti-Boone referral to the tribe of Gad, which was mentioned in Lenin's publications. Indeed, I cannot provide any other explanation. On July 21st, the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets Congress of Councils, had issued a proclamation about a struggle against anti-Semitism, quote, about the only resolution approved by the Congress unanimously, well that tells you something, 
without any objections or arguments, just so they'll go on to make, quote, anti-Semitism a capital offense when they take full power. When in the end of June, 28th and 29th, the re-elected Bureau of the CEC had assembled, they had heard a report, quote, on the rise of anti-Semitic agitation, mainly in the northwestern and southwestern gubernias. A decision was made immediately to send a delegation of 15 members of the CEC with special powers there, subordinating them to the direction of the, quote, Department on the Struggle Against Counter-Revolution. On the other hand, Bolsheviks who advanced their agenda under the slogan, quote, down with the ministers capitalists, not only did nothing to alleviate this problem, they even fanned its flames, along with the anarchists, despite the fact that the latter were headed by one Bleichmann, B-L-E-I-K-H-M-A-N. They claimed that the executive committee was so exceptionally lenient toward the government only because capitalists and Jews control everything. Isn't that reminiscent of Narodnaya Volya, the, people, the People's Will, terrorist organization of 1881? And when the Bolshevik uprising of July 3rd and 4th broke out, it was in fact targeted not against the already impotent provisional government, but against the Bolsheviks' true competitor, the executive committee. The Bolsheviks slyly exploited the anger of soldiers toward Jews, by pointing them to that very body. See, there they are. But when the Bolsheviks had lost their uprising, the CEC had conducted an official investigation, and many members of the Commission of Inquiry were Jews from the Presidium of the CEC. And because of their, quote, socialist conscience, unquote, they dared not call the Bolshevik uprising a crime and deal with it accordingly. So the Commission had yielded no result and was soon liquidated. During the garrison meeting arranged by the CEC on October 19th, just before the decisive Bolshevik uprising, quote, one of the representatives of the 176th Infantry Regiment, a Jew, warned that, quote, those people down in the streets scream that Jews are responsible for all the wrongs. At the CEC meeting during the night of October 25th, Gendelman reported that when he was giving a speech in the Peter and Paul Fortress earlier that afternoon, he was taunted, quote, you are Gendelman, that is, you are a Yid and a rightist. When on October 27th, Gotz and his delegation to Kerensky tried to depart to Gatchina from the Baltiski rail terminal, he was nearly killed by sailors who screamed that the Soviets are controlled by Yids, as was the case. And during the wine pogroms on the eve of the glorious Bolshevik victory, the calls slaughter Yids were also heard. And yet, there was not a single Jewish pogrom over the whole year of 1917. Think about that. The infamous, outrageous pogroms in Kalusha and Ternopol were in fact the work of frenzied, drunken revolutionary soldiers retreating in disorder. They smashed everything in their way, all shops and stores, and because most of these were Jewish-owned, the word spread about Jewish pogroms. But they weren't, he's saying. A similar pogrom took place in Stanislavov with its much smaller Jewish population, and quite reasonably it was not labeled a Jewish pogrom. Already by midsummer of 1917, the Jews felt threatened by the embittered population, or drunken soldiers, but the ongoing collapse of the state was fraught with incomparably greater dangers. Amazingly, it seems that both the Jewish community and the press, the latter to a large extent identified with the former, learned nothing from the formidable experiences of 1917 in general, but narrowly looked at the, quote, isolated manifestations of pogroms. And so time after time, they missed the real danger. The executive power behaved similarly. When the Germans breached the front at Ternopol in the night of July 10th, the desperate joint meeting of the CEC of the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies and the Executive Committee of the Soviet of Peasants Deputies had taken place. They had acknowledged that should the revolution perish, the country crumbles down, in that exact order, and then named provisional government a, quote, government for the salvation of the revolution, unquote. They named provisional government a government for the salvation of the revolution, which is all they care about, and noted in their appeal to the people that, quote, dark forces are again prepared to torment our long-suffering motherland. They are setting backward masses upon the Jews. Close quote. On July 18, at a panel session of the State Duma in an extremely small circle, Rep. 
Maslenikov spoke against the executive committee and, among other things, spelled out the real names of its members. Panel session of the State Duma. Speaking to very few people, he said, hey, look, this is a bunch of Jews. On the very same evening, at the factional meeting of the CEC, they beat an alarm. Quote, this is a case of counter-revolution. It must be dealt with according to the recently issued decree of the Minister of Internal Affairs, Tseretelli, on suppression of counter-revolution. The decree was issued in response to the Bolshevik uprising, though it was never used against the Bolshevik. In two days, Maslenikov made excuses in an article in the newspaper Wretch, speech. Indeed, he named Steklov, Kamenev, and Trotsky, but never intended to incite anger against the entire Jewish people. And, quote, anyway, attacking them, I had absolutely no wish to make Jewish people responsible for the actions of these individuals, close quote. So even when Jews get, do bad things, they're treated as individuals, even though they work together as a tribe. Then in mid-September, when all the gains of the February Revolution were already irreversibly ruined, on the eve of the by now imminent Bolshevik coup, Yah, Yehuda Kantorovich warned in wretch speech about the danger that, quote, the dark forces and evil geniuses of Russia will soon emerge from their dens to jubilantly perform black masses. Indeed, it will happen soon. Yet what kind of black masses? Quote, of bestial patriotism and pogrom-loving, truly Russian national identity. So they hate real Russians just the way they hate real Americans. In October in Petrograd, I, Trumpledor, had organized Jewish self-defense forces for protection against pogroms, but they were never needed. Indeed, Russian minds were confused, and so were Jewish ones. Several years after the revolution, G. Landau, looking back with sadness, wrote, quote, Jewish participation in the Russian turmoil had astonishingly suicidal overtones in it. I am referring not only to their role in Bolshevism, but to their involvement in the whole thing. And it is not just about the huge number of politically active people, socialists and revolutionaries, who have joined the revolution. I am talking mainly about the broad sympathy of the masses it was met with. Although many harbored pessimistic expectations, in particular, and anticipation of pogroms, they were still able to reconcile such a foreboding with an, accept an acceptance of turmoil, which unleashed countless miseries and pogroms. It resembled the fatal attraction of butterflies to fire, to the annihilating fire. So Jews murder tens of millions, and the real problem is Jews are suicidal even as they're homicidal in actuality. It is certain there were some strong motives pushing the Jews in that direction, as we move on to 448, and yet those were clearly suicidal. Granted, Jews were not different in that from the rest of the Russian intelligentsia and from the Russian society, yet we had to be different. We, we the ancient people of city dwellers, merchants, artisans, intellectuals, we had to be different from the people of the land and power, from peasants, landowners, officials. And let's not forget those who were, who were different. We must always remember that Jewry was and is very heterogeneous. Now he's being, he's just basically a typical, he's a, he's a typical Anglo-conservative who happens to be uh, a long beard Russian. It's, that's really all I take away from it. I've never thought he was all that remarkable. Cer he's certainly not a remarkable thinker. As a writer, I don't know. I'd say he's mediocre. Um, but you know, he did something that no one else did. There's not really much other record of what actually went on there. If, and if I think he mischaracterized, at least he freaking did something. So we have some knowledge that the Jews were heavily involved in the revolution. So that's, that's I guess, what we get out of it. But yeah, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Jews are no monolith. They're all totally different. They're very heterogeneous. Not at all pulling in the same direction. I've heard that bullshit before. Russian or English, it still stinks. That attitudes and actions vary greatly among the Jews. No, they really don't. They're reconciled by the fact that Jews are race, they're loyal to each other, and all they care about is what is good for Jews. So it was with the Russian Jewry in 1917. In provinces and even in the capital, there were circles with reasonable views, and they were growing as October was getting closer. The Jewish stance toward Russian unity during the months when Russia was pulled apart, not only by other nations, again, the backdrop of this is the World War I is going on, but even by Siberians, was remarkable. Quote, All over the course of revolution, Jews, together with the great Russians, were among the most ardent champions of the idea of great Russia. Now, when Jews had gotten their equal rights, 
What could they have in common with different peoples on the periphery of the former empire? And yet, the disintegration of a united country would fracture Jewry. In July, at the Ninth Congress of Constitutional Democrats, Vinover and Noldi openly argued against territorial partition of peoples and in favor of Russian unity. Of course, Jews always want centralized power. It's good for them. Also in September, in the national section of the Democratic Conference, the Jewish socialists spoke against any federalization of Russia, in that they had, in that they had joined the centralists. Today they write in an Israeli magazine that Trumpledor's Jewish detachments backed the provisional government and had even foiled the Kornilov's mutiny. Perhaps, says Solzhenitsyn. However, in rigorously studying events of 1917, I did not encounter any such information. Well, God knows the Jews never lie, so look harder. But I am aware of opposite instances. In early May 1917, in the thundering, patriotic, and essentially counter-revolutionary Black Sea delegation, quote-unquote, the most successful order calling for the defense of Russia was Jewish sailor Batkin. As it sounds. Deep Asmanic had published letters of millionaire steamship owner Shulim Bezpalov to the Minister of Trade and Industry, Shakovsky, dated as early as September 1915, quote, Excessive profits made by all industrialists and traders lead our motherland to the imminent wreck, close quote. He had donated half a million rubles to the state and proposed to establish a law limiting all profits by 15%. Unfortunately, these self-restricting measures were not introduced as rush to freedom progressives such as Konovalev and Rybushinsky did not mind making 100% war profits. When Konovalev, Konovalov himself became the Minister of Trade and Industry, Konovalov, one word, when Konovalov became the Minister of Trade and Industry, Shulam Bespalov wrote to him on July 5, 1917, quote, Excessive profits of industrialists are ruining our country. Now we must take 50% of the value of their capitals and property, and added that he is ready to part with 50% of his own assets. Konovalov paid no heed. I guess he's trying to make a point that some Jews cared about the future of the state. I, I'm not really sure. In August, at the Moscow All-Russian State Conference, O.O. O. Grusenberg, a future member of the Constituent Assembly, stated, quote, these days, the Jewish people are united in their allegiance to our motherland in unanimous aspiration to defend her integrity and achievements of democracy and were prepared to give for her defense, quote, all their material and intellectual assets to part with everything precious, with the flower of their people, all their young. We'll move on to 449. These words reflected the realization that the February regime was the best for the Russian Jewry, promising economic progress as well as political and cultural prosperity, and that realization was adequate. The closer it got to October coup, and the more apparent the Bolshevik threat, the wider the realization spread among the Jews, leading them to oppose Bolshevism. It was taking root even among socialist parties during the October coup. Many Jewish socialists were actively against it. Yet they were debilitated by their socialist views, and their opposition was limited by negotiations and newspaper articles until the Bolsheviks shut, those de shut down those newspapers. It is necessary to state explicitly that the October coup was not carried out by Jews, though it was under the general command of Trotsky with the, and with energetic actions of young Grigory Chudnovsky during the arrest of provisional government, and the massacre of the defenders of the Winter Palace. So he refutes himself, as far as I'm concerned. It wasn't absolutely a coup carried out by Jews, but he says it was not. And why is it necessary to state that explicitly, if it's a fact? Broadly speaking, the common rebuke that the 170 million people could not be pushed by Bolshevism, that 170 million people could not be pushed into Bolshevism by a small Jewish minority is justified. I disagree with that. Indeed, we had ourselves sealed our fate in 1917 through our foolishness from February to October, December. To my way, he's doing similar to a Jared Taylor type thing, blame whites rather than Jews. Well, yeah, in one sense, yes. But in the historical way in which he's writing, no. 
this absolutely was Jews. You wouldn't have this Bolshevism and this horrible, miserable, murderous communism without Jews. Not the theory, not the practice, not the execution. The October coup proved a, but it, but it's important to record, he is not blaming the Jews. And I, I think he's just simply doing a typical conservative cowardly weakness in, in avoiding the truth. The October coup proved a devastating lot for Russia. Yet the state of affairs, even before it, promised little good to the people. We had already lost responsible statesmanship, and the events of 1917 had proved it in excess. The best Russia could expect was an inept, feeble, and disorderly pseudo-democracy, unable to rely on enough citizens with developed legal consciousness and economic independence. After October fights in Moscow, representatives of the Bund and Puali Zion had taken part in the peace negotiations, not in alliance with the Junkers or Bolsheviks, but as a third independent party. There were many Jews among the Junkers of the Engineer School who defended the Winter Palace on October 25th, and the members of Sinegub, or Sinegub, S-I-N-E-G-U-B, a palace defender, Jewish names appear regularly. I personally knew one such engineer from my prison experience. And during the Odessa city Duma elections, the Jewish bloc had opposed the Bolsheviks and won, though only marginally. During the Constituent Assembly elections, quote, more than 80% of the Jewish population in Russia had voted for the Zionist parties. Lenin wrote that 550,000 voted for Jewish nationalists. Quote, most Jewish parties have formed a united national list of candidates. Seven deputies were elected from the list, six Zionists and Grusenberg. The success of Zionists was facilitated by the recently published Declaration of British Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ball 4, on the establishment of Jewish National Home in Palestine, which was met with enthusiasm by the majority of Russian Jewry, that is, celebrated demonstrations, rallies, and worship services took place in Moscow, Petrograd, Odessa, Kiev, and many other cities. The Lord Balfour Declaration. Prior to the October coup, Bolshevism was not very influential among Jews. But just before the uprising, Natanson, Kamkov, and Steinberg, on behalf of the left socialist revolutionaries, had signed a compact a combat pact with the Bolsheviks Trotsky and Kamenev. I think he's being naive here, if he's not being dishonest. And some Jews distinguished themselves among the Bolsheviks in their very first victories, and some even became famous. The commissar of the famed Latvian regiments of the 12th Army, which did so much for the success of the Bolshevik coup, was Semyon Nakimson. Quote, Jewish soldiers played a notable role during the preparation and execution of the armed uprising of October 1917 in Petrograd and other cities, and also during suppression of mutinies and armed resurrections against the new Soviet regime. It is widely known that during the historical session of the Congress of Soviets on October 27, two acts, the Decree on Land and the Decree on Peace, both in apostrophes, were passed. But it didn't leave a mark in history that after the decree on peace, but before the decree on land, another resolution was passed. It declared it, quote, a matter of honor for local Soviets to prevent Jewish and any other pogroms by dark forces. Pogroms by red forces of light were not anticipated. So even here at the Congress of Workers and Peasants Deputies, the Jewish question was put ahead of the peasant one. And that ends the chapter, remember, so the average Russian is a peasant, is a serf, he's liberated 40 years before, but he's still pretty backward, and the government never really gave a damn about him. They're still thinking always and always and ever about Jews, and now Jews have fomented a successful revolution. No matter what he says, this was Jewish in origin and Jewish in execution more than any other group. Without Jews, would it have happened? No. So they are the key thing. The sine qua non. Anyway. It's a dismaying, disturbing, and hard to read story because of all the difficult names, but this is important history to know. And we listen to this not because it's inherently interesting in itself, maybe it is, but I, I go to it for the patterns. And the pattern here is Jews are always for what is good for Jews. And what is good for Jews is always the opposite of what is good for whites. Jews in any white nation will always be seeking to destroy it to make it digestible for themselves. 
what they did in Russia, they did in Weimar, Germany, they did in the UK, they did in France, they did in Australia, they do in New Zealand, they do in every single country they are allowed to penetrate. The way forward for whites is to form a whites only nation, make it absolutely explicit that this is the reason it exists, have a monocausal government that is dedicated to the preservation and expansion, extension of the race and all the ways that means. And that's the only thing that government worries about. And it is a capital crime to try in any way to undermine the racial basis of the nation. And in this way only are you psychologically, intellectually, and eventually militarily in other defense ways prepared to defend your race, to value it at its true value, and defend yourself against this other team, Team Jew, that has already worked all of this out. I've been Alex Linder, reading you Chapter 14 of 200 Years Together by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You can find everything we record at vnnforum.com permanently in our audio section, and also I post daily links at Kirksville Today and on Pieville.net. Thanks for being with me, and I'll be back with you again for more from Solzhenitsyn real, real soon.